They run top notch. Gotcha. Now it's system. <clears throat> Josh, you good? Jasmine, we're started. All right, here we go in three, two, one. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Sports Medicine Broadcast, Eye Injuries from Sports with Dr. Pham, number 188. This week, our guest is Dr. Pham. She is with the Houston Retina Associates. She is uh, my ophthalmologist. I went to see her when I had a problem. I uh, had, it looked like bugs flying every time I looked left or right. And I was like, man, what's going on? So, so I, my wife said, here, call the doctor. And then the uh, optometrist called and said, hey, you need to go see a uh, specialist. So then they sent me to Dr. Pham and then Dr. Pham took care of me. Uh, about two, three weeks later, I was more or less all good to go and I haven't had a problem with it since. So, you know, throughout the course of the several different visits, we had several conversations. Uh, and one of the things she used to do was work right, right outside of a sports arena or sports clinic. Um, and so she saw lots of soccer injuries and stuff like that. And so I was like, well, that'd be a perfect person to talk to. Got expertise. <laughs> So uh, we have Dr. Fang here joining us as we're talking about eye injuries. Of course, I am your host, Jeremy Jackson. Sitting right, right beside me, we got Juanita, Joshua, Jasmine, Cooper, Tiana. We have Dr. Yellen joining us. Hello. And Good Dr. Fang. See you again. We have lots of other students, Daniela, Mariana, and Jasmine taking notes. We have Yvette over on Twitter. Nelly is using a hashtag. Nick is on cameras, and Ariana is controlling the PowerPoint. So this is the first time we're going to be having a uh, PowerPoint presentation. Dr. Fam's got uh, some slides there, so Jasmine should be showing those on the live stream. I'll also have that linked in the in the show notes. I'll have that presentation there available uh, for you to see if you're downloading and listening to this later. Again, if you want to join the conversation, like I said, Nelly is on hashtag the SMB on Twitter. So without much further ado. Uh, Jasmine, let's go ahead and flip over to the presentation, and we will get to Dr. Pham. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me today. It's an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Shapa Pham. I'm one of the retina uh, doctors over at Houston Retina Associates. Um, and like Jeremy said, that he was my doctor, or he was my patient. I was his doctor. Uh, <laughs> Moving uh, up in the world. <laughs> a while back. So here, uh, first, uh, a little bit about my practice is uh, I'm with uh, a practice that has five doctors, and uh, it's John Alipat, Michael Lamb, myself, Usha Penenti, and Dr. Lee Tran. And we have five different locations throughout the Houston area. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Jasmine, you got to flip. Maybe uh, next slide. And uh, since I'm uh, lecturing to young people today, I would like to uh, kind of break down uh, briefly what it takes to get to uh, to become a doctor. So basically, you have four years of undergraduate studies. You can basically uh, major in anything you want, uh, biology, economics, English, whatever you want, as long as you take the prerequisites for uh, medical school. And then after that, you uh, you take a uh, standardized test to for entry into medical school. And then after that test, you apply to medical school. Medical school is four years. After the four years of training, you have uh, three to four years of uh, hands-on training, actual work uh, uh, for your uh, specialty. And uh, for myself, I did uh, three years, one year of internal medicine, which is general practice, and then three years of ophthalmology. And I went into further training two more years for uh, vitro retinal surgery. And, and now we're here. <laughs> Next slide. So I'm just going to go over a little basic anatomy. Uh, and uh, I just want to uh, make a clarification that some of these pictures are very graphic. <laughs> so, And uh, the pictures uh, that I uh, got for the presentation, I put all the references uh, uh, on the bottom of each slide there. So uh, basic anatomy, uh, the eyeball we call a globe because it's round. The front part of the eye is called the cornea and it's basically like a window or a windshield into your soul. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, and then uh, uh, be uh, there's a space filled with liquid uh, called the anterior chamber uh, right behind the cornea and behind that you're gonna have your iris which is the colored part of your eye. And behind that, you're going to have a crystalline lens, which is what we're all born with. And in the space uh, that looks more orangey or pink, uh, uh, that fills up, occupies most of the space of the eye, uh, is uh, a jelly material called vitreous. And uh, the, uh, the layers of the back of the eye are the retina, and then layers of blood vessels, and then the sclera, which is the, part of, uh, the white part of your eye. And then also the optic nerve, which is the yellow 
uh, line uh, in the back uh, to your right there. Okay, next slide. Uh, so two ba basic mechanisms of injury in sports uh, is basically a, a blunt trauma to the eye uh, uh, from balls, bats, and whatnot. Uh, so you're going to have a coup and contra coup uh, injuries. A coup injury is where you have impact uh, at the site of impact and you have damage at the site of impact. And then the contra coup injury is where you have the uh, impact at the site of co contact. It pushes uh, the uh, eye backwards and then you have a, um, a recoil. And then that recoil is called the contra coup injury. And here it's a picture uh, on this slide of the brain. But the same thing happens to the eyeball because it's in an enclosed space. Next slide. Uh, so we're just going to break down uh, the types of injuries in the eye here. So we uh, categorize them by closed globe and open globe. And for the part of this, most part of this lecture, I'm going to talk more about closed globe injury. Uh, so you can have contusions or lamellar lacerations. What lamellar laceration means is that you don't have a complete hole in your eye. So when we go to open globe, that means there's a... Um, a hole in the eye through a laceration. And so there's different types of uh, lacerations. You can have penetrating, which means there's an entry wound, but no exit wound. And then an IOFB means that there's an intraocular foreign body. Um, here you can have, um, we've seen pencils to the eyeball, uh, uh, nails, different things. But related to sports wise, it's very rare for us to see an intraocular foreign body. Um, we see rocks um, into the eye, metal pieces, and that's really related to uh, when you're doing something at high velocity, and then that uh, uh, that high velocity particle gets uh, you know into the eye that way. Uh, so people uh, lawn mowing, uh, and then the um, hit a rock, and then the rock flies into the eye. So that's very important to wear protective eyewear when you're uh, doing those types of activities. And then also a perforating injury is when you have an entry wound and also an exit wound. And that's really rare as well. Uh, so, uh, but that's going to be beyond the scope of this lecture. So next slide, please. So you can have an eyelid laceration, believe it or not, or not with sports. And the reason how, how you would get this is because basically an, a finger to the eye. So I've seen... Uh, uh, kids that play basketball and uh, they reach up for a layup or whatever, try and get the ball, and you kind of scratch, scratch down, and they pull the <laughs> down. So I th think this is going to be the maybe most gruesome picture. And so, uh, so that is a pretty obvious injury. Uh, basically, you want to just keep this uh, injury. Um, you don't want to put anything on it. Uh, kind of keep it clean and dry, and then go to see the doctor as soon as possible. If you can't go to a doctor as soon as possible, I just wet uh, some water on a gauze and just uh, put it over there to kind of keep the tissues moist and not dry out. All right, let Next. me let me jump in for a second. So for those of you that are listening later, there's there's a picture again. I would I'll put the slideshow in the show notes. So check out check it out. But it looks almost as if you cut down the center of the the bottom eyelid and then just folded it down. And so you've seen this. You've seen this yes. injury. Uh -huh. And then how did this happen? So uh, uh, basically uh, trying to get the ball on a rebound and, and uh, the, uh, the opposing team grab, tried to grab the, the ball and swiped it and got his finger into the, uh, the, the student's eye. Uh, and the, there's like a sack. I guess when you pull your eyelid down, there's a space there. And so his finger got caught there and then he just ripped it down. Hmm. And that's really rare for something like that to happen, but it can happen. Is that the only way that that type of injury, or like if you're a softball player and the foul ball comes up, can that also rip your? It's very eyeball? rare yeah. that that happens. Um, yeah, very rare. Okay. Yeah. Next slide, please. So this is a uh, more uh, common uh, sports injury related uh, uh, eye condition. It's called a corneal abrasion. So basically, if you have an eyeball, uh, I mean, a basketball, a soccer ball, softball hit in the eye, uh, you can cause a scratch in the front surface of the eye. And in this picture, uh, we use a dye called fluorescein to, uh, to help highlight the, uh, the cells that are damaged. And so the damaged cells look more green. And so uh, this is a picture of uh, the front of an eye. And 
uh, there's a green patch of uh, uh, that's colored in front of the eye that indicates that there's some damage to that tissue there. So for this, what you're going to have is uh, symptoms that the student's going to have is decreased vision, pain, light sensitivity, and then also um, uh, a lot of tearing. Uh, so uh, whenever you have an eye injury, uh, it's you always want to assess how their vision is. So you always ask your teammate or classmate, uh, how's your vision? And then, you know, usually you can go from there. Do you have pain? Uh, and so those are the two important questions to ask uh, your teammates whenever you, uh, they have an eye injury. And so for this, we uh, basically lubricate, keep the eye lubricated. This is very painful. And the reason why it's very painful is because there are lots of uh, nerve endings that uh, supply the cornea, which is the front part of the eye. And this is important because whenever we have um, uh, any dirt or dust that goes into our eye, it's a protective mechanism. We feel it so that we can blink our eyes and then uh, to protect our eyes from injury. So when you say lubricate the eye, how are you going to do that? Because the last time you talked about getting the gauze wet and put it on there with the laceration, right. what are you doing here? Right. So this lubrication uh, for us, we uh, we may or may not use an antibiotic ointment or gel. Uh, and then also uh, we use artificial tears. Uh, typically we have to, uh, when something like this happens, you have to examine the, the whole eye as a whole, make sure there's nothing going on in the back part of the eye as well. And so it depends on if there's anything else that's going on. So uh, an antibiotic ointment or so artificial tear ointment. The times that I've dealt with a corneal abrasion, you know, we go and we go see either the ophthalmologist or optometrist and they'll, you know, prescribe the, the artificial tears, but there's also a lidocaine, there's xylocaine in it with an antibiotic. Is that normal protocol or are they, are these different types of? Okay. So typically I don't prescribe anything with a, with a uh, xylocaine or, or a, um, I guess a dead and like yeah. so that you don't feel it. And the reason why I don't do that is because if you are going to have another injury to your eye, you can't feel it and, mm. and it can make the situation worse. So the times where somebody said, you know, that corneal abrasion, the, the description they'll give is feels like something is, but you know, it's very irritated. Mm -hmm. And so you would rather them feel that yes. so that they can protect themselves rather than not feel that exactly and go out and do something. Exactly. Okay. And, and when you don't feel what's going on in your eye, if you're rubbing a piece of sand in your eye and you keep rubbing it and rubbing it, you can actually get that sand or foreign body into the front part of your eye or into the chamber of your eye and cause more problems. Mm -hmm. and, create overgrowth. That's a great question. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, the next thing that can ha happen, I'm going from the front part of the eye to the back part of the eye. So this is the space bet uh, between the uh, cornea, the front part of the eye, and then also between the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. This is the anterior chamber. And um, uh, so uh, basically you can have inflammation and what it looks like is basically if you uh, open a window and then you let the sunlight go in and you see all these little particles that kind of float up, like, looks like dust particles. That's basically what we see inside your eye if you have this traumatic iritis. So this causes pain uh, and can cause decreased vision. And uh, usually it's uh, from uh, the the damage or trauma to the iris and then the iris releases all these inflammatory mediators and uh, we treat this with some steroid medications uh, and we have to monitor the patients pretty closely because if you have inflammation in the back part of your eye that will really cause decreased vision and uh, all these uh, uh, eye injuries needs to be followed pretty closely because we need to look for um, uh, other bad things that can happen in association with these eye injuries so all the chemical mediators that would be released in an ankle sprain, right? Leukotaxin, necrosin, histamine. Mm -hmm. exactly. It's the same thing that's happening in this iritis. Exactly. And so what's, you, you said that you're going to treat it with a corticosteroid because that's going to decrease inflammation. Mm -hmm. What else would you be able to treat it with and what types of things are you looking for? Okay. So for this patient, uh, usually uh, we'll treat them with steroids, topical mm -hmm. steroids, and then also a medication called atropine. And what that atropine does, it, uh, dilates the eye, but then mm -hmm. it also stabilizes the blood uh, blood barrier mm -hmm. and uh, to decrease the inflammation as well. So same atropine, like if somebody's in cardiac arrest, they'd administer atropine. Right, but that atropine is administered through your IV, and uh, the atropine that we use is an eye drop. Interesting. Yeah. This is so cool. So, <laughs> so, slide, so this wouldn't 
go away by itself? You, you would need the steroids? Um, sometimes it'll go away by itself. Uh, but if I see inflammation in the eye after some trauma, I'm, I'm pretty much going to start on the steroids. And, and so then, the, the iritis is happening because of trauma. Is it some sort of, like, for instance, somebody takes a racquetball to the eye, mm -hmm. right? Yes. I, you're going to expect iritis. You know, you, you may expect a corneal abrasion. You may expect a detached retina, but you're definitely looking for this iritis. You know, right. can, can you walk us through? So basically, you, uh, it's something to look for. Not mm -hmm. every patient is going to have the iritis. Mm -hmm. So uh, so it may be if you have the injury, it may last for a day and then it'll go away. And then by the time you go see the eye doctor, you don't see the inflammation anymore. And will they know it? Like, will they see floaters or something? So you won't see floaters. What you'll see is uh, you'll have light sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And that's and there's uh, uh, there's a uh, I guess a pattern going on here. So if it, you have decreased vision, light sensitivity, those are really things that you have to go see the eye doctor for. So in a typical scenario, right? Somebody's concussed. They're photophobic. They're, you know, they're having some trouble with vision. They, and so all these are going. All these are confounding factors. Right. So, so you really there's a huge differential there. Exactly. Exactly. And so. So that's why, um, you know, uh, all these uh, eye findings, we use a microscope to look at mm -hmm. these things. You know, it's not something that you can just look, uh, you know, straight in your eye and be able to see it. So that's why it's so important to get an eye exam. For me, I uh, would rather uh, see a patient and not find anything and be like, okay, you have this trauma, but your eye looks great. That's so fine. in your recommendation, when somebody receives a blunt trauma from a concussion, you would also recommend that an eye exam is part of that concussion evaluation. Right, especially if they're complaining of decreased vision and photophobia. And Which are all signs and symptoms of a normal concussion awareness. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And then I also recommend um, using eye protection for everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it depends on how, you know, how much you see and stuff. But yeah, I would recommend just getting it uh, evaluated. So all the, all the, uh, uh, professional sports teams have an eye doctor on staff, right. and so, uh, and most of most of them, uh, you know, for the most part, they don't have that many eye injuries. But uh, there's a lot of corneal abrasions and stuff that go on. Uh, and so, in the athletic training, we're trained to to work with you know otoscope and ophthalmoscopes, right? Mm -hmm. But my understanding of the ophthalmoscope is that I'm able to look and say, okay, I know that's a retina, and I know what a normal retina is supposed to look like, and I know that's not normal. So mm -hmm. refer to Dr. Pham, right? Right. And so um, if I were to take an ophthalmoscope and look, I'd be able to see this iritis if I knew what I was looking for? Uh, or is it, take a, is, is it a higher caliber type? The ophthalmoscope, depending, uh, well, the ophthalmoscopes that I've used, I, you can't see iritis. You, you can have a portable slit lamp, mm -hmm. which is like the microscope, to mm -hmm. be able to see the iritis. <laughs> um, and also the ophthalmoscopes that most people use is very a very limited view of the retina. So if if you can see the optic nerve with the ophthalmoscope and a few vessels, and that's great. But there's another um, ophthalmoscope called the pan optic, where it just gives you a wider field of view. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, our next eye injury is called an, a hyphema, and this is where you have uh, injury to the eye causes uh, some bleeding from the uh, iris vessels uh, into the anterior chamber uh, of the eye, and you can see red. Uh, layer of blood and uh, because of gravity it makes the blood settle to the bottom and then you can see a distinct line across uh, sometimes uh, you can have uh, blood fill up the whole entire front part of the eye and that's called an eight ball hyphema and we call it an eight ball hyphema because it's a, an eight ball in full is black and so the whole eye looks black um, uh, so you can have decreased vision because of this hyphema uh, pain and the pain may be related to eye pressure issues. So uh, normally what happens with the hyphema or blood in the eye is your body breaks down uh, the blood cells and it, uh, it um, gets resorbed by the body again. And so sometimes if the blood stays into the eye, in the eye too long, it can cause scar tissue to form. And also when scar tissue forms, it, it uh, blocks the outflow channels of fluid in your eye. And so it can cause increased eye pressure. And increased eye pressure is bad because when you have high eye pressure in the eye for a prolonged period of time, it causes damage to the optic nerve. And that optic nerve uh, 
you know, sends message to your brain so that you can see. And once you have damage to the optic nerve, it's, it's permanent and it's not reversible. Mm. So I hope you don't mind me. No, I, okay. I love All it. All right. So with this high FEMA, right, you're talking about going back to the orthopedic setting. This would be synonymous with, let's say I had like a myositis of hands from a you know, deep contusion, mm -hmm. or I had this increased pressure, right? And so if I had like this uh, submungal hematoma, it would be easy for me to release the pressure, right? Mm -hmm. But the pressure is building up here and there's no way to release it. So you're asking the body to reabsorb all this right. without creating damage to the nerve. Right. So that's why it's very important to see a, an eye doctor when you have something like this, because if for the most part, the eye pressure is fine, but if, if the eye pressure goes up, then we have to put you on medications to help decrease the pressure. So there's uh, medications that help uh, uh, decrease the uh the body from making more fluid into sure, the eye, sure. so it's called aqueous suppressant. And then there's also medication that increases the outflow of, uh, of fluid from the eye. And uh, and so uh, those are how we help to control the eye. And we start with drops first, and if mm -hmm. the drops aren't working, then we start on uh, some pills. And so uh, the pill is uh, called uh, acetazolamide or diamox mm -hmm. uh, that we typically use, and that. Uh, really uh, uh, blocks the sodium channel, uh, sodium potassium uh, mm -hmm. channel, and so, yeah, or sodium chloride channel, sorry. So everything that's happening in the eye is the same thing that's happening all over the body. Right, there's more contained space. Right, we just know it's a very, yeah, exactly, contained space. Right. You have less to work with. Then. Exactly, yeah. Interesting, yeah. okay. All right, Dr. Fam, I'm going to jump in real quick. There's a question from the live stream I'm should be shown right there all right so this is greg jumping in what can cause a patient to have unequal pupils with no history of trauma no history of putting in drops or contacts or touching the eye pupils did even out within 24 hours uh, i think that means by the way or between within 24 hours between one of the two we couldn't figure out what caused them to be unequals any thoughts there so usually uh there's a big, huge differential for unequal pupils. So we always want to think about trauma, and this patient obviously had no trauma. Uh, we want to think about a Horner syndrome, uh, which causes uh, uh, meiosis, which means constriction of the pupil, and hydrosis, which means no sweating. And um, um, and so uh, those are some of the things that we have to think about. There's a thing called Aedes tonic pupil that can also uh, cause pupils to be unequal. Uh, you can also have physiologic uh, anisocoria, which means it's just a difference in pupil size that's just physiologic. That's normal for that person. Um, uh, you can have uh, tears to the iris, uh, sphincter tears that can cause the pupils to be unequal sizes. Uh, also, very rarely this happens. You can have migraine headaches that can cause pupils to be unequal sizes. But in young patients, uh, uh, I think that it's going to be very important to do a workup uh, right. to roll out the big bad stuff like right. masses and right tumors. because you know typically you see anisocoria you're thinking pressure on that third cranial nerve mm -hmm. exactly. right and exactly. so what you're saying is that it could be congenital right it could be these other pathological diseases that are causing this exactly and so yes um, it can range from anywhere from being real benign which means it's you know from the physiologic anisocoria mm -hmm. to a tumor or a mass and so I think that's uh, one thing in medicine that that uh, uh, we don't, we shouldn't take lightly is that uh, when you see something it, you can't just pinpoint or, or you just can't say oh it's not a big deal you know you have to look at the entire picture like the uh, the uh, person who asked the question they have to know history of trauma mm -hmm. um, and different things so. um, you know obviously in athletic training these different populations so if you're dealing with uh, school age children middle school high school some colleges they may have been prescribed certain medicines to either help them in school or certain medicines, you know, just along the way. Are there some medicines that can also produce this, you know, anisocoria that we need to be aware of? So if a student is on a stimulant for a learning disability or something along those lines, w would a side effect be this? Uh, not particularly, not like something that's jumping right at me. Okay. Uh, at me. I mean, okay. uh, there's medications that do affect the back of the eye. Uh, uh, that cause increased pressure yeah. and uh, and stuff like that, but not typically an, an even pupil. All right, so here we're talking about inside of the iris, right? This this bleeding is hyphema. What about when it's on the white part of the eye? Because you know, I had a coach come up to me. Hey, does this this look normal? I was like, man, I don't know. I, I know that the bleeding can cause pressure. You may want to get checked out. And so he ended up going, and then the, his optometrist or opth ophthalmologist 
said, you know, yeah, I think it'll resolve within two weeks. And yes. so, so, so those are two different things. Are we going to get to that? Right. Uh, right. That's not something that I did add uh, to that, but that's a great question. So it's called a subconjunctival hemorrhage. So it's basically bleeding in the white part of your eye. And that typically doesn't, uh, doesn't have any visual changes. Usually you don't have any pain. Some patients will have some mild irritation. Like it can feel, uh, the eye can feel a little dry. And so typically for that, it will clear up in a couple of weeks. And I tell my patients that uh, it'll be red and then it'll change mm. to green and then yellow as the red blood cells start to break down. But that doesn't affect vision and that usually improves. So it's the same color we would see like in an ankle sprain, right? This, this exactly. infusion and ecchymosis that's happening in the eyeball and it's just going to get reabsorbed. Right. right. But we can't put bag of ice on the eyeball. <laughs> no. We just got to let it. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of times you just need to give them reassurance because it just looks a lot worse than it actually is. You know, if if you come in with bleeding around your whole eye in the white part of your eye and your vision is twenty twenty, I'm gonna be, you know, that's great. So. Great. All, All right. right. Next slide, please. Jasmine, you're switching back. There you go. All right, Adiana. Halloween coming up. This is really cool stuff. <laughs> so uh, this is a picture of some iris sphincter tears, and it's it's uh, your pupil are supposed to be round and uh, sometimes uh, because of trauma, you can have tears in the, the colored part of your eye. And what it'll look like is like a little wedge, like a tip of an arrow. And it's very subtle and it's very difficult to see. And so when you have trauma with iris sphincter tears, it can cause your pupils to look really, really weird. It won't look perfectly round. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it'll look like a tadpole mm -hmm. uh, or oval, uh, things like that. So, uh, and so what causes an iris sphincter tear? blunt trauma just the force of the uh, of the trauma can cause the tear so we've talked about a lot of blunt traumas to the eye um, are some of these also when you're taking a history is it possible like somebody's lifting a lot of weight right and they increase their interthecal or intracranial pressure can that cause some of these like iritis can that that's a great question so uh, uh, when you increase uh, intra-abdominal pressure, you can also increase intraocular pressure. Mm -hmm. And so you can have things like bleed. You can bust one of the small blood vessels, superficial blood vessels in the white part of your eye and cause a subconjunctival hemorrhage. So pay, uh, so uh, students who are like weightlifters, things like mm -hmm. that, they can get subconjunctival hemorrhages. Just uh, by weightlifting, by not exactly. breathing through it. And, exactly. And then there's also studies that... that uh, we're looking at uh, intraocular pressure with weightlifting. Mm -hmm. And so it's pretty interesting. Your, yeah, your pressure does go, your eye pressure does go up transiently mm -hmm. with uh, weightlifting. Next slide, please. Ooh. So this is really, really blunt trauma. So uh, this is called an irritodialysis where the iris is separated from the uh, white part of the eye. And um, uh, it, it looks really bad. Uh, and it can be really bad because it can cause decreased pressure or decreased eye pressure or increased eye pressure. And so uh, typically when patients have this, you have to check the rest of their eye as well to see if there's any uh, uh, subluxation of the lens or a hemorrhage in the back of the eye. Uh, I did a surgery on a patient with uh, iridodialysis from uh, a trauma. Uh, he had... Uh, uh, he was in a car accident. He had his lens dislocated, and um, and then that, that uh, the uh, iridodialysis. And so I took his lens out, and uh, I did a repair. Uh, uh, so it's more like a uh, we call it an iridoplasty, where we just kind of reconnect it back to uh, to where it belongs, and we put an artificial lens in his eye. So iridodialysis occurred from that coup contra coup, right? So he was in a car accident. He had that massive forward and backward. And that acute blunt pressure causes tear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like wow. really, really severe, severe wow. trauma. You know what I love here is What's that she that? just glanced right over. I took his lens off and put a fake one on. She just just talked about yeah, it like it was normal, the, yeah, right? Like, yeah. I'm, yeah. Not, I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? And now me? he can see the Saturn, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right? right? And That's so, right. Yeah. and now he's got this focus. <laughs> so let's say let, let's take it out of that car accident i've got a quarterback that gets hit from a big lineman from the back mm -hmm. that linear coup contra coup because right? we know in concussions now there's there's a, a lot of other movements that happen but that linear coup contra coup would that be enough pressure to cause something like this not typically it, it would be very rare i mean uh, uh we can see lens dislocations from that uh, but you have to have an underlying 
problem for that gender. Yeah. Like we've all heard about Marfan syndrome, yeah. it's like collagen disorder. Yeah. And so uh, uh, the uh, lens is held up, uh, suspended in the eye by uh, uh, structures called zonules. And those, those are basically made out of collagen. And so in Marfan's disease, you have a defect in that. And then, uh, so it's more brittle. And so mm -hmm. it breaks easier. So if you have a, an injury, a blood injury like that, it can cause this mm. mutation. Okay. Next slide, please. And the, uh, this, we're moving uh, towards the lens subluxation. The, you can see the natural lens kind of going down, and we call this a sunset sign, where it's like setting like the sun. And uh, typically, uh, uh, we would see this in patients with an underlying collagen disorder, like Marfan syndrome, uh, because these zonules are very thin, and they look uh, like hair-like projections, and there are thousands of them that keep the lens suspended into, in the eye, but they're very, very strong. So uh, in cataract surgery, uh, you you remove this this lens, but you leave the zonules still suspended, you know, in intact, so that we you can put the art we can put the artificial lens in. And sometimes uh, in some of my surgeries where you have a lens subluxation or some different problems where I have to take the whole entire thing out, the zonules are very, very strong. And mm. so it's very difficult to take it out. And so, uh, but in patients with Marfan syndrome, uh, uh, the zonules are more brittle and break more easily. Uh, and in a patient like this, what we would have to do is we would go inside the eye and remove that lens and then put an artificial lens in. And my uh, favorite word is zonules. <laughs> right. And that's, uh, that, that would be, uh, uh, a lot of uh, discussion with the patient and uh, a lot of, um, uh, I guess, preparing them mentally uh, for the surgery and then also for the follow-up visits and uh, guide them through how long it's going to take for their vision to get back. Okay. Next slide, please. So um, this is rare. You can have a traumatic cataract. So you have blunt trauma to the eye, uh, the coup and contra coup forces again, and uh, uh, so the, the lens can turn a complete white color, and uh, and this you can uh, you can see in some patients, and usually it's uh, um, it's from harder harder uh, injuries like uh, metal to the you know metal pipe or something to the eye, uh, wow. things like that. I think in sports related injuries, I don't I hard, rarely see this. Maybe, maybe like in hockey, you know, somebody would yeah. take a That's you know right. a puck to the eye right. or. Exactly. You know, in hockey, they're, they're, I mean, it's nuts. They don't have <laughs> mandatory right. eye shields. Yeah, so. my brain is not on hockey because we're in Texas. But yeah, yes, right. exactly right. So if you took a puck to the mm -hmm. eye or a stick to the eye, mm -hmm. that would be enough to create something like yes. this. Mm -hmm. So uh, and in cases like this, we would uh, take the lens out like uh, in our uh, cataract surgery and put an artificial lens And in. the zonules are still there. Depends. So we have to assess. <laughs> you just wanted the to say the word. I wanted to write that <laughs> word in. <laughs> we have to assess uh, the situation of the zonules. If they're intact, then we'll just do a straightforward cataract surgery and place the lens inside the bag. But if the zonules are are uh, are messed up, then uh, we have to sew in a lens. And at the end here, I'll show you a video of how we sew in the lens. Cool. Next slide, please. So this is called commotio retinae. And uh, this is typically from blunt trauma, BB gun to the eyeball, a ball, whatnot, the coup and contra coup. Those forces are going to dissipate somewhere. And so uh, sometimes they will choose the retina to dissipate in. And the, the retina has different layers, like a sandwich. It's nine different layers. And the top layer of the retina is, ca is called the nerve fiber layer. And so um, th this, um, the forces shear the uh, I guess causes disruption of the retina and then it causes this edema or swelling of the back of the eye. And so what it'll look like, it'll look white and your vision, most of our vision is going to be 20, 20, but if you have the swelling in the back of your eye, you only be able to see hand motion or 2400 is really, really significant visual change. Uh, on exam, you won't see, typically you won't see anything. It'll be a normal exam until you look at the back of the eye, you see this white spot. Hmm. And so, uh, generally, uh, the vision will return in a few weeks, but the patient is more at risk for getting uh, abnormal blood vessel growth in the back of the eye, uh, swelling in the back of the eye uh, that's more permanent. So 
So those uh, glaucoma, so those things we kind of watch out for. So you hear about another condition that uses this word commotio, right? Commotio cordis, where it's this is heart kind of thump and it immediately stops. And so is it possible that the eye just dies from this? No, not typically. No. There's other other um, disease entities that cause that causes that. You can have an avulsion of the optic nerve where mm -hmm. it's completely dissected, and that can cause complete death of the eye. Mm. And you know, there's no going back there. And the only time that I saw an avulsion of the eye uh, or the optic nerve was uh, with gunshot wounds, bilateral avulsion of the optic nerve. Wow. Straight through. Wow. So. And they lived. Uh, yes. Wow. Yes. So That's this, crazy. This young man was like 20 something years old and um, was involved in a gunshot situation and uh, he w woke up from his coma blind. But and so the bullet gone. went through and through here and took out both optic nerves. Yes. Holy cow. Yeah. And that's very that? rare. That's crazy. That's nuts. Yeah. Other than that, you're walking around with a patch. Your name is Jack Sparrow. That's it. <laughs> yeah, so, Peg leg um, McGregor. Yeah. Yeah, so that, uh, so uh, that you know, causes death of the eye. But in the commotion retina, for the most part, you have good prognosis. Hey, I have a homework assignment for all the students. Go look up what the Latin translation of commotion means. Got it. She's so Googling it right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so next slide, please. So uh, in uh -huh. young patients, we, we always talk about the jelly in the eye. It's called the vitreous. And uh, basically, it's mostly water, but... Uh, but when we're born, uh, uh, there's a structure. Um, I describe it as uh, a frame, a wooden frame of a house, and then inside, in between the wooden frame, it's filled with water. And over time, that wooden frame breaks down or degenerates, and then it becomes more of a liquid. And that's a normal aging process. In young patients, the uh, the vitreous is very more like a jelly material. So when you have a coup contra coup injury, there's really not much room for it to move. And mm -hmm. if it's more of a liquid, it can move around a little bit more. So when you have those types of injuries, uh, the uh, jelly or the vitreous is very adherent to the retina. And if you have uh, um, an injury, you can cause, uh, the forces can cause, a, cause you to have a retinal tear. And uh, you can see in the picture uh, that uh, basically, it's like a, a U shape, and we call this a horseshoe tear, where it has a flap, uh, and that's lifted. And then you can see uh, uh, the space behind the retina, uh, more of an orangey color. And in these situations, we have to see the patients right away. Uh, and if it's just a localized tear, uh, then we do a laser procedure to help seal the tear uh, to prevent fluid from going through uh, the back of the retina and detaching the retina. And so... Um, uh, the symptoms that patients will have, flashes of light, floaters, decreased vision. And if they have, um, if there's fluid in the back of the eye, they can also describe a shade coming through their field mm -hmm. of vision. So those are really and So on physical exam, right, you have somebody that, that took a hit. Mm -hmm. And so on physical exam, you know, obviously when you're, you know, we're trained that optic nerve, right? Can you see this? Can you see this? And so their, their field of vision is going to be cut. Right. And so as I start to get on that periphery, they're going to lose it. Right. And that's a good indication of clinical examination where you say, this may be a retinal tear, this may be a retinal detachment. Right. Right. So you're clear here, but I lose it here. Right. Okay. And next slide. So here's a picture of a retinal detachment. You can see up on top uh, uh, there, the color looks a little bit different. It's hard to see 3D wise, but um, <laughs> it's more of a yellow sheet orange and you can tell that there's fluid behind there. And so what we really want to do is prevent the fluid from going uh, down into the center part of the eye called the macula, which is right next to the nerve. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, uh, you, typically uh, if you have a MAC on, which a retinal detachment, which means that the fluid has not uh, uh, infiltrated through the middle part of the eye, you have a good visual prognosis. And so we would do surgery to repair this retinal detachment. And going back to the ophthalmoscopes that we use, would we be able to see that or no? This, this one, is... probably not, because mm -hmm. you'll probably just be able to see this area. That you can right, and that would look normal. Right. Yep. Next slide, please. So this is Isaiah uh, Austin. Do you all know about Isaiah Austin? Isn't he the one that was drafted so and has some Marfan? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he had uh, Marfan syndrome, mm -hmm. right? And they discovered all these different abnormalities. Right. 
this being yourself a bigger issue. I mean, yeah, you have the disease, but can you imagine he made it through all those other PPEs, right? Mm-hmm. right? And they kept on getting cleared and kept on getting cleared. Right. And so uh, he wrote a book called Dream Again, and uh, it basically tells a story about what he went through. So as a, a child, I think he had bleeding in his eye from playing basketball. And so there was blood in his eye and then um, and his pressures went up and then he developed a retinal detachment. And so he went through multiple surgeries, but he was still able to play basketball all this time. And so when you, you have two eyes, you have uh, what we call binocular vision. You can have a stereo vis- visual acuity, which means you can have really great depth perception. And so when you have one eye that's out, your depth perception is going to be off. And so Isaiah, what's great about him is he used his other cues to figure out his depth perception. And that's why he did so well, uh, um, you know, throughout um, his college career and everything. And so uh, this story really is great because it tells his journey, but then it also tells, uh, you know, how perseverance and then, you know, overcoming um, obstacles and stuff. So I would highly recommend it if you guys want um, a book to read. Yeah, an amazing story. <laughs> yeah. An amazing story. So um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a video uh, it's, uh, of an intraocular foreign body removal. This patient was a young patient that um, had, oops, that had a traumatic cataract uh, in the intraocular foreign body, and it was like a piece of rock. So this is a video? Yes. So, All right, Ariana, you have to you have to click on the. There you go. There you go. All right, so there will be people listening live, so you can just continue okay. describing. So what's basically, going on. Uh, uh, this is a picture of the eyeball, and what we did was uh, we put three uh, trocars, <laughs> uh, t- uh, one uh, trocars for fluid infusion into the eyeball to maintain its shape, and then the other two are for our instrument, our light instrument, and then also our uh, our cutter. So in order to get to the foreign body. We clean out the jelly material called the vitreous, and then we use our instruments to go in to get the uh, the foreign body. We have to assess the situation where the da- where the damage is and everything, um, and we use a um, a knife, a blade to cut open the uh, the white part of the eye so that we can put for- get forceps in there, and the forceps go in there, and then we pull the foreign body out. And all this is happening under microscope. Yes, that's right. And so it's like delivering a baby. It's going to come up in just a second. Here it comes. And we always have to make sure that the incision is wide enough to deliver the foreign body because when the foreign body gets caught in the white part of the eye, it's like really difficult. So right now she's enlarging the wound um, to make it a little bit bigger so that she can pull the foreign body out. And do you remember what it was that went in? It was a rock. And you can see it in just a second. Yeah. All right, so right now they're... They're enlarging the, the wound. Uh, at, so it's in the white part of the eye with a blade. Uh, and she's using forceps. And she's cutting it wider on both sides there. Um, and this was my mentor that did the surgery, Dr. Renoso. You okay, Destiny? <laughs> <laughs> and there is the piece of rock right there. And see wow. How it gets caught. And so after this, um, the rock is removed. We sew up the eye. <laughs> and then uh, we also put an artificial lens in. So if you can imagine, the patient has a lot of inflammation after this. And so uh, whenever there's a foreign body into the eye, uh, there's a lot of counseling that goes on to tell the patient like what to expect, how much vision they're going to get back. So. And so, you know, this is like uh, growing up with my friends, you know, we would get like in rock fights. Mm-hmm. This is it, right? This is what happens. This is what happens. And the funniest thing is, is that the one that I really got in right rock fights a lot with, his dad was an eye doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was just trying to generate business. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> That's funny. So uh, next slide, please. And so um, you can also have bleeding in the middle cavity of the eye called vitreous hemorrhage. And um, that's when uh, the coup contra coup injury causes shearing of the blood vessels in the back of the eye. You can push play. And so uh, we uh, do this uh, 
through the same mechanism. We placed the trocars, three of them. And this patient had diabetes, but she had bleeding in the eye. It mm -hmm. wasn't from a trauma, but I just wanted to show you. So here's insertion of the trocar. And the trocar is an instrument that you guys are using? Uh, it's uh, kind of like a tube, like an yeah. inner tube, where we, uh, it's, it helps us uh, place our other instrument. Uh -huh. in it's a delivery apparatus. Yeah, so yeah. it's like a... Oh, there's music that comes oh, in. Yeah. <laughs> is this what you all are operating to? Is this right, yeah. I usually operate to like uh, Selena Gomez. Do you really? <laughs> you know, it depends on the specialty, like orthopedic surgeons, ACDC, <laughs> ophthalmologists. Yes. Uh, when y'all operate, where do y'all put the anesthesia? So yeah. we uh, use an injection. <laughs> Not of anesthesia. Medication. Anesthesia. <laughs> yes. Uh, we put an injection of numbing medicine in the back of the eye. Y'all put it right here. Yeah, in the back. Mm -hmm. So you oh. can see it's obviously it looks very cloudy and white there. Looks like a worm. This is incredible. It really looks like there's a worm I mean, swimming I can inside. See them dancing in the operating room, you know. <laughs> And see, you can see the blood, like the red spots of, uh, of blood in the back of the eye there. And uh, as the blood clears from the back of the eye, it also changes colors, just like how red blood cells break down. And so mm -hmm. some of it will look fluffy and yellow. Mm -hmm. and so. And uh, I did this surgery. And uh, this patient, she was a 24-year-old uh, Hispanic female who has diabetes and mm. has the blood in her eye, but um, it's the same surgery that we would do for a vitreous hemorrhage from trauma. Sure. And so typically vitreous hemorrhages or bleeding in the eye clears up uh, for the most oh, part, and it, it takes several months to clear up. But if it doesn't clear up, then we do the surgery. So you said that obviously, you know, to be a physician, you go four years in medical school. Where'd you go to medical school? I went to Southern Illinois University. Oh, you're Saluki. Yes. Okay. And then you did your your internship. In internal medicine, where? In New Orleans. At, where in New Orleans? Oshner. Oshner. Mm -hmm. And then you did your residency at Oshner? At LSU. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I lived in uh, Louisiana for nine years. Oh, awesome. I was just out there uh, this last weekend. And then you did your fellowship? At LSU as well. LSU, New Orleans. Uh, we did. We covered all of Southern Louisiana. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure. A lot of eye injuries right. in Louisiana. Right. <laughs> A lot of eye injuries eye. and teeth injuries. <laughs> right. right. That's what it is. Okay, so that's the video for the vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, next slide, please. So this is... Um, uh, okay, this is a video of uh, placing an artificial lens. Dr. Tran from our practice did this one. Um, so here we're preparing the scleral bed, which is the white part of the eye, uh, for the uh, surgery. Um, so we're cutting down... Um, controlling the bleeding with some uh, some pottery, which is, <laughs> and we're marking the eye so that we can see where three and nine o'clock are. Um, and it's very, it needs to be very precise so that we sew in the lens properly. Um, so we're marking, uh, pre-marking all the spots where we're gonna put the trocars in. This is, this is crazy. And so now we're putting the trocar in, uh, here uh, we have the camera that's attached to the microscope and then the DVD recorder. Uh, we have a, a mechanic, a thing called a lid speculum that keeps the eye open during the surgery. But like you don't know when to get off with the lid speculum. You don't call it like <laughs> long or just then you open it this way, you just stay like this. Oh no, uh -uh, no. <laughs> good question. <laughs> So we're putting all the trocars in place. Wow. It's so different from orthopedic surgery, you know? It's like... <laughs> and, <laughs> and so here, um, uh, we're, we put a cover over the front part of the eye to protect the eye from light, because when you have so much light for a long time in the eye, it can cause damage to the retina, so we're protecting it. So like ski blindness. Yes. That's, that's, that's the right. same thing. <laughs> yeah. Snow blindness, yeah, correct. Yeah, snow blindness, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, we're cutting through the front part of the eye with a, oh my God. a blade so that we can slide the lens in. So if it just asked, do y'all put fluid inside of the eye? I <laughs> yes, know, like you were saying. That's a balanced salt solution. 
So yeah, it keeps it from being dried out. So. That's right. And Good then we, we drop the drops on top of the eyes to keep it from drying out. And so this is the artificial lens. He's going to load the sutures through the lens. It has four different uh, uh, holes where we load the suture. And he's going to thread it through the uh, trocars uh, and then sew it in that way. It's amazing. Jeremy, I have to. Yeah, and students actually are going to be following you out too. So. Okay. Well, I got to go to NASA, so they're not going to NASA. No, 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 no. Um, it was a real pleasure meeting you. Thank if you. If so I much. gave my card, would you come and lecture oh. to our athletic training program? Oh, awesome. Of course. Is that okay? Is. Yeah. That'd would be you good. email me? Sure, sure. No problem. Great. Thank you so okay. much. It's, it's nice a real to pleasure. Meet you. Jeremy, thank you for including me. Yes, sir. The next episode will be Wednesday. Should be. Not this Wednesday. Should, yeah, it should be the next Wednesday. Okay. I'm going to make it. The 21st, I think. Because I teach from. 10 to 11 30 on monday and wednesday so i'm going to make it a point to be here all right whether the students are coming with me or not all right <laughs> sounds good thank you. all right thanks it's nice right meeting you i'll be uh, calling you all right so i want to jump in here real quick and we may have time to you know before you have to get back to do some more videos and stuff um i'm going to switch seats okay All right. All right. So good there. Let me switch over to me. So one of the questions I have, I know it's hard to see me there, is um, the thing that we see most is going to be dirt or being poked in the mm -hmm. eye. Mm -hmm. And so how do we treat those on the field? Okay. On the field. So what you need to do is uh, get eye wash solution and just irrigate the eye as much as possible. All right. So it's um, a specific eye wash type solution that you prefer, or is it just kind of any? So eye wash solution uh, is pH balanced, so it needs to be specific. It just needs to specifically say eye wash on there, uh, not a uh, not saline solution, not contact lens solution. So it'll specifically say eye wash, and so uh, it usually comes in a squirt bottle. And what you do is you ask the uh, uh, the patient to look up and then you will hold, when they look up, you pull their lower eyelid down and you squeeze the solution in there. And then you'll ask them to look down and you pull their eyelid up and then you squeeze the solution in there. And that usually gets out all the debris. So we have eye wash, it says eye wash on it, and then there's eye wash cups. So uh -huh. we put the solution in the cup and then they put their eye down, look up, blink, 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 and we're uh -huh. back. Is that more or less the same thing? Yes. Okay, cool. So good, so that's, that's more or less all we can do on the field to right. remove that stuff. Right. And now, is there is there anything I can do? Because I always tell the kids, look, you got poked an eye. It's going to take some time. There's nothing I can do to make it better faster. There's nothing I can do to help you get back out on the court or field faster. Is there any? Is that correct? Right. Like I said, with, with Dr. Yellen, he was asking, is, is there tetracaine or some numbing solution that you can use? And I would highly not recommend that. <laughs> right, yeah. I was talking about specifically me. Like, you know, maybe I have volleyball on Tuesday, somebody gets poked in the eye. Yeah, you just no. got to set it out. I mean, uh, I think when you're playing sports that the, the um, you want to be a team player, you want to be anxious to, to play and help the team out, but you have to think about the long-term consequences of what's going to happen if you play uh, or if you go back on the field. You know, I mean, for eye injuries, it's not that critical as compared to other things uh, that I've seen, you know, in sports-related injuries, but um, that's something to consider. All right. The other thing is now that we have them off the field, um, and he talked about having the the otoscope or the ophthalmoscope. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have any of those here in our athletic training room. I haven't been trained to use them. Is that something that, in realistically, like in a high school setting, is going to be beneficial? No, I don't think so. I so think I'm never going to have you come to one of our games, right? <laughs> you're just you're here because you're in the presentation. So. Right, right. So I think it's good if you have eye wash on hand, artificial tears on hand, and maybe an artificial tear ointment actually. So if you know they're in pain or uh, discomfort, you can uh, wash the eye out and put some artificial tears in it and then put the eye ointment in there. And uh, usually if uh, they're having a lot of burning pain, whatnot, uh, uh, then just uh, lightly tape the eye with uh, paper tape just for a short period until they can see the doctor. But you know, there's other situations where it's more urgent. And if they have complete loss of vision, they need to be seen right away. Is there any reason we wouldn't use eye wash or artificial tears or the artificial tear ointment? Okay, so that's not going to hurt anything. So if you have a situation where there's an injury and you use the uh, eye wash, it's not going to hurt anything. If there 
is something in the, inside the eye, like a penetrating injury or perforating injury or a foreign body in the eye, even if you use irrigation to, to wash it out, uh, that would still be okay. It's just um, if, it, if it's severe pain, uh, severe decrease in vision, and you knew that, that something went into the eye wall and not just dirt, like um, a piece of metal or something like that, then uh, try not to push on the eye until you get seen because if it's an open injury and you push on the eye, the contents of the eye can come out. You know, so, And then uh, you can also uh, increase uh, infection risks and stuff like that. But for the typical run-of-the-mill eye injury in high school and stuff, you know, artificial tears and eye wash is pretty good money. All right. Um, sorry to ask. Is there any, besides everybody wearing glasses all the time, <laughs> is there anything that we can do to prevent eye injuries on the field, sports related? Eye injuries on the field. I mean, when you're doing a contact sport, that's just one of the risk factors of playing the sport. You know, um, in football, you have the helmets and that kind of uh, covers it. But um, the uh, only recommendations for um, for eye protection are usually kids that wear um, glasses or corrective lenses you know I think the recommendation is not to wear contact lenses when you're playing sports uh, uh, but um, more like the rec specs looking thing mm -hmm. uh, um, that's protective and plus it, you can uh, help you see better so not anything specific other than the um, than the um, eye protection <laughs> yeah uh, Rachel she's watching live she threw out there that uh, our a lot of our fields are artificial turf, so they have all these little black rubber pieces. Uh -huh. So they we get those in the eyes a lot with soccer, with football, with rugby, uh -huh. that kind yep. of thing. Yeah, and that's so. irrigation with the the eye wash. All right, okay. and then so what if they feel like the irrigation with the eye wash doesn't get it out? Just do it again and again. Yes, yeah, so you can repeat it uh, like two or three times until it gets they feel relief. Uh, what we do in the office is we flip the eyelid and make sure that. Uh, it's not embedded in the eyelid and causing the scratching. And sometimes if you irrigate it too much, it can cause dryness of the eye and cause more irritation. So there's always a balance there. And then flipping the eyelid, that's not, I mean, you, you know, whenever I was in high school, I would see kids doing that themselves, yeah. but that's not something you'd recommend. Somebody no, like me I doing. wouldn't. I would just let, let the doctor do it because uh, you, when we flip the eyelid, we look under the microscope as well. So we have a better view. All right. So again, don't do anything more than we're trained to do. Okay. <laughs> um, one of the big questions is, if I was going to have a team eye doctor, how would I go about doing that? Um, what do you recommend me finding an optometrist that, or or an ophthalmologist that I need to send the kids to? Because here, I mean, you can see the big Memorial Hermann banner. So, uh -huh. you, are you work for? You uh, we, uh, I am credentialed at Memorial Hermann. Uh, um, you can. Uh, so, if the kids have their own optometrist or eye doctor, then I think that's, that's going to be best. That's going to be best, yeah. And so uh, I would start by seeing uh, their personal eye doctor okay. first. And you can uh, call an optometrist or ophthalmologist. Uh, usually optometrists work more on the weekends. or uh, And uh, ophthalmologists, they're typically somebody on call. But um, basically the optometrists are kind of like our gatekeepers for, the, for eye disease. And if they see anything more, then they would refer them to um, the appropriate Got you. So just to go back over that, start with whoever they have. Uh, you know, again, this is high school. This isn't college. College is probably going to, you know, a big a D1 school is probably going to have somebody right. on there. Right. I don't know if payroll is, but they're going to have somebody on their call list. So, yeah. All right. So that's probably going to be the best way to go about that. Right. All right. Um, let me see. I think that's, that's most of the questions that I had. I wanted to cover real quick. Um, did you have other sides that you really wanted to get to? I know we. Oh, that was it. That was our... the last video. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let me see. I think that's all I have here in the chat as far as questions. Um, so there was an article. Let me click on it. I had it open over there, but I guess that changed. So Mike McKinney, he's been on here a couple of times, talked about having um, these tools ready. So I'm going to just, you can say yes or no, or good idea, bad idea, whatever. Okay. So up. Ophthalmoscope, so here at a high school, yes or no? No. Okay, a pin light. Pin light, good idea. Okay, uh, it says light source with blue or cobalt filters. Um, not necessarily. Okay, vision chart. 
vision sharpening. All right, good. We have those for our physicals. Cotton tip swabs. Yeah, that would be good. Saline. Uh, saline eye wash. I wish we talked about that. Magnifying glass. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, that's it. All right. Okay. And then I showed it because he was just talking eye about shield, yeah. having these tools uh, on hand for uh, a team physician to, to oh, use. Oh, oh, for the team physician. So so if there's a physician, then the, the cobalt uh, blue light, uh, it's only a good idea if you can have fluorescein, which is a stain that I use uh, to um, stain for the corneal abrasion. Because if you gotcha. don't have that stain, the cobalt blue light's not gonna do any, uh, give you any benefit. Gotcha, so then having medications here, but most likely it's gonna be the doctor is gonna bring them with them. Mm -hmm. Especially in our case, if we just happen to have an overzealous ophthalmologist that wanted to work with Pasadena High School, then so we'd, we'd have him bring his own stuff, I guess. Yeah. So, um, all right, any quick tips about contacts because he wrote some different things about you know not using your contact lenses when playing sports or right. don't um, share contact lens cases and those kind of things right so so contact lenses are very uh hygiene for contact lens wear is very important and not only i mean it's not related to sports injury so we recommend that you don't wear contact lenses uh, when you're playing sports because it might get dislodged or or stuck in your eye or something like that i mean we can always take it out but but um, that's a reason why we don't recommend contact lenses. Uh, the eyeglasses will give you more protection for sports. Uh, but specifically to contact lenses, uh, hygiene is very important. You don't share uh, anybody else's uh, contact lens case. Uh, you have to use contact lens solution, not saliva, not tap water, because uh, that has a lot of bacteria. And when you have bacteria on your contact lens, you can have uh, get corneal ulcers. And, Corneal ulcers is basically an infection of the front part of the eye, and, the, and it's pretty much bad news bears when you get the corneal ulcer. So make sure you take your contact lenses out every night, clean them, and store them in the appropriate solution. Wow, because that um, I guess I just missed that, but usually we'll see kids put them in their, like if they drop them on the field, they find them, they put them in their mouth, and they put them back in their eye. No. <laughs> wow, that's that's good because now I know, hey, I need to have that solution so that they can rinse it off and then put right. it back in. Right, yeah. And so Preferably send them to the bathroom to wash their hands first. Exactly. So you have you can just keep a bottle of the all-purpose solution mm -hmm. where it's a cleaner, disinfectant, and uh, storage solution all in one. And that would help with that. All right. Uh, any other parting tips on eye injury? Um, I, I just think that uh, if uh, you have a blunt injury to the eye with decreased vision and pain that doesn't get better, uh, I mean, you just need to go see an eye doctor. <laughs> so. And again, if you're in the Houston area or even in Katy, because she just said to work out in Katy too, right? Is that uh, in Willowbrook, there's Willowbrook. offices in Katy, uh, Sugarland, uh, and uh, Houston, and Clear Lake. So I've had... Uh, a great time with Dr. Pham here on the podcast today, but just in all of my visits, very cordial, uh, very willing to answer questions. So thank you very much for everything. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. So um, how would someone get a hold of you or your office if they wanted, if they were in this area or wanted to talk so to you? So our office is use a main uh, contact number. It's uh, The number is 281-495-2222. And uh, all of my messages get to me and uh, I call, uh, return my calls pretty uh, in a timely fashion, I think. So I always got a call back each time I called. So, <laughs> all right. Um, well, it's, that's going to be pretty much it. So if you want to check out our website, sportsmedicinebroadcast.com, where you can watch live almost every Wednesday on our website. Again, this was a special Monday edition because it fit Dr. Fan's schedule better. Uh, you can join the conversation. Most of the time you're going to find me on Twitter. Don't forget about looking at, uh, getting your free $50 from sportshealth.com slash SMB. The December code is FUBAG, F-O-O-B-A-G. Again, sportshealth.com slash SMB. I've had great success so far with them as well, ordering supplies and responsiveness. So again, sportshealth.com slash SMB, where you can enter to win a $50 gift card each month. Uh, again, F-O-O-B-A-G is that there so for jeremy the sports medicine one kids dr yellen from the university of houston and dr fam that's a wrap awesome that was fun i wanted to take a picture with all the kids in here oh <laughs> sorry i, I could have gotten one if you would have no, that's okay. Okay. It's anything
I went to Southern Illinois, kind of. Get out of here! No, um, well, actually, my degree is from Ottawa, Illinois, and I'm trying to uh, maybe send the professors to uh, Sky Air Force Base one weekend. Uh huh. Uh, if I could finish my bachelor's here. Yeah, I'm surprised that you went to Southern Illinois. Uh huh. 